Barry, do I have do I have the co-host privilege to move the slides, or how are we doing that? Sorry, I didn't ask. Um, I don't know. Why don't we? Uh, as soon as I turn it over to uh, Sarah, we'll be uh, back in the line and we'll uh, ask her. Okay. Okay, it looks like it's 12.15, so uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're, we're delighted to be back with you uh, for our Clinical Conversations program. And, um, and so, so my name is Barry Sarvet. I'm the, the medical director for, for McPAP. Uh, and we have a really nice uh, panel uh, with, uh, who I'll well, introduce uh, momentarily. The, the, as you know, the, the Clinical Conversations program takes place every fourth Tuesday of the month from 12.15 to 1.15. Uh, the topic that we have for today that we're, we're, we have um, queued up for you is uh, entitled uh, uh, How to Assess Behavioral Health Needs During COVID-19. However, I do want to uh, let you know that, that we're, it's a little bit different from what we originally planned, that we, that we initially said that we would have um, kind of a McPAP uh, behavioral health clinician panel and, and actually that we have an external speaker um, who is uh, going to be joining us uh, and presenting to us today, who's um, a friend of McPAP. Uh, and we also have um, a primary care uh, provider uh, and leader you know, from uh, general, uh, general pediatrics community who is going to be part of our panel as well as uh, one of our uh, McPAP child psychiatrists. We also actually uh, plan for the conversation to be more broad than uh, just how to assess uh, behavioral health needs uh, during COVID-19, but we want to open it up to uh, talking about uh, management of patients uh, as well as assessment. Uh, and we're also going to go uh, and have a focus on, on virtual care, uh, which is increasingly uh, the way that we provide care in behavioral health uh, these days. And, and we want uh, to start out with a, with a presentation from uh, our uh, external speaker, who I'll introduce <laughs> in a moment, um, to talk more in detail about telehealth in, in, in psychiatry, particularly for primary care providers. Uh, so just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we are recording the session as usual, and it can be accessed on the MCPAP website at www.mcpap.org. Um, you can download a copy of the slides from the website uh, shortly after we're finished. Um, and it's under the newsletters and webinars page under the About McPap uh, menu. Uh, we will take, we're gonna have a discussion actually after the initial presentation. Uh, and today we actually are really looking forward to having more uh, of a whole audience discussion, not just you know, questions uh, for the panel. So, so we actually want to be able to ask questions to the audience too and really have a, have a discussion about some of this stuff. So, so the way that's gonna work is that uh, we'd like people to use the raise hand uh, feature, at the, which is at the bottom um, menu of your screen. If you click on your screen, you'll see uh, different uh, menu items and, and there should be a raise hand uh, kind of a button uh, down there. So if you want to answer a question, raise your hand. Uh, and uh, our, our uh, Sarah Rosadini, who's our, our program coordinator, will, will unmute you so you can just uh, ask your question. Um, you can also use the chat uh, function as well if you uh, want us to read your question and if you don't want to talk you know, on a, a live on, on the webinar. Uh, at the end, uh, there's going to be a brief survey uh, following the presentation, and uh, we're really uh, eager to hear feedback about everything that we do so that we can improve future presentations. So uh, just a few introductions for our speaker. Uh, the first introduction is for Dr. Ujwal Ramtakar, um, uh, who is a child and adolescent psychiatrist uh, from Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, and he is uh, currently serving at the, as the Associate Medical Director for Partners for Kids, which is one of the largest pediatric uh, ACOs um, uh, in the country, you know, I believe, that are you know, focused on, on pediatrics. Uh, there's 330,000 lives across 34 counties. Uh, and his main interests in child psychiatry are uh, telehealth, 
uh, population health, uh, collaborative care models, and primary care integration. Uh, before he uh, came to Nationwide Children's, uh, recently, Dr. Remtekar served as the founding medical director of the Missouri Child Psychiatry Access Project, which is the Missouri version um, of uh, CPAP model, which is what MCAP is. Uh, and he also serves on telepsychiatry and quality improvement committees at the uh, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Uh, the next introduction is for Dr. Betsy Brooks, um, who is a uh, pediatrician, and she's currently the Associate Medical Director for PPOC, uh, which is obviously, uh, I think for people in Massachusetts, a network of primary care pediatri pediatricians across the state uh, affiliated with Boston Children's Hospital. Before she did that, or before she took on that role, she has 30 years of experience as a general pediatrician at Holyoke Pediatric Associates, which is a large uh, primary care pediatric practice in Western Mass. And she has a long-standing interest in behavioral health, uh, and served as a screening tool consultant for uh, the CBHI in the state, uh, and is also a co-author of the uh, AAP uh, NicheQ uh, ADHD Toolkit uh, and a collaborator on a um, uh, project uh, to work on the primary care implementation of the GLAD PC, uh, which uh, was something we did together uh, a number of years ago, uh, Betsy and I. Um, and she's been a long standing friend of McPat. Uh, and then finally, uh, last but not least, is Dr. Charlie Moore. Uh, and, and Dr. Moore received his, um, his uh, medical degree from the University of Kansas, uh, and he's a triple boarder meaning that he has uh, uh, board uh, eligible training in pediatrics, adult psychiatry, and child psychiatry uh, from Tufts Medical Center. Uh, he is uh, one of our McPat medical directors for the Southeast uh, region. Uh, and he currently works as the medical, or he previously worked as the medical director of the BEST team in uh, the early 2000s. And um, he used to be at Tufts. Uh, in uh, 2000 to 2009. Uh, he's been with McPap since the very beginning uh, in 2005 as the medical director of the Boston Tufts uh, children's team. Um, and uh, he uh, at Tufts also had uh, an involvement in education as the uh, associate child psychiatry residency training director. Uh, so, so we have a, a, a lovely panel uh, for you and um, and I think we'll, we'll turn it over to Dr. Ramtakar to, to kick off the uh, session with a presentation about telehealth in psychiatry. Uh, you're still on mute, uh, Ujwal. There you go. All right, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I was trained at Boston Children's, or the Boston Children's Hospital, and so it's good to be back talking to everybody in Massachusetts. Um, um, as Dr. Sarvet um, uh, said, my interest has been in telehealth and now with COVID-19, we all had to pivot and, and um, adapt quite a bit. And so we've been doing this series around um, some basics of um, uh, telehealth uh, consultation um, uh, for both behavioral health and non-behavioral health uh, presentations. So, so today the objective is not around really doing a full consultation or the collaborative care model or PEP model, but it, uh, the objective um, is uh, simple. Uh, I can't seem to s move the slides for some reason. Yeah, we may um, ask Beth or Sarah to um, advance the slides uh, for us. Okay, um, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so <clears throat> this is the common concern and this is what my simple objective is. The left is around having anxiety about how do we suddenly change everything to telemedicine and I hope by the end of 25 minutes of talk, we will be a little bit more excited about it. Next slide, please. Um, so why do telehealth consultation? Again, if you're in any Midwestern state, the left is what is true for a majority of us, where um, the parents and the families and the kids have to travel long distances. Um, if you're in uh, northeastern states and Massachusetts, the right is probably the one, not only just the weather, um, but um, also the traffic and other things that are very anxiety probing for the families. Um, and if you're in Ohio, then both of these things can happen in the same day, uh, since we are so unpredictable when it comes to weather. 
Um, next click. Um, but these days, why telehealth consultation is because of these uh, stay at home uh, restrictions and shelter at home restrictions because of COVID-19, where we cannot afford to um, have any discontinuity um, in the care that we provide for children, particularly if they have chronic medical or uh, behavioral health illnesses, since they really need to um, continue to receive care. Next slide, please. So telemedicine by definition by CMS was a two-way real-time interactive communication. And, and they had to um, uh, put this definition in place because any electronic devices that are otherwise used could have been considered telemedicine or teletechnology. Um, so traditionally, this was the way that you have to have some kind of real-time uh, interactive communication. Now, if you notice, it doesn't say video based uh, communication. It says just two-way interactive communication. Uh, so that was a little bit of difference which kind of allowed um, other modalities like telephone to be used in certain instances. Uh, next slide. So there are some terms that are basics. Um, one is synchronous when the video conferencing or, or um, phone uh, a consultation is live when it's happening in the moment, but asynchronous is the one where um, things could be recorded and could be assessed later on. So many times, for example, uh, for children with autism, um, some testing or structured interview is done um, and recorded and later on the expert evaluates that. Um, so that's kind of the asynchronous um, type of uh, telehealth. Most commonly practiced and reimbursed is synchronous, but I think we could move a little bit towards asynchronous in certain cases. Then there are two other um, terminologies, uh, which is provider site and patient site, which is self-explanatory. But sometimes the other um, uh, terminologies that are used are uh, uh, originating site and distant site. And so one has to be very clear as to what it is referring to. Um, even though it's counterintuitive, distant site is where the provider is and the originating site is where the child or the family is. Um, so we, one has to be very clear as to uh, the, what those terms mean. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now things changed in March uh, where the um, OCR released a emergency guidance during the COVID-19 emergency and it kind of relaxed a lot of definitions and regulations. Um, so initially it had to be HIPAA compliant uh, in order to have any telehealth visit, but now the platform doesn't have to be. So other platforms like FaceTime, Skype, Google Hangout, etc., can be used to conduct the video visits. Now there are some implications including revealing your numbers and revealing your Apple ID and, and other things um, that, uh, that folks can have access to and they can contact you at other times. Um, and there are certain ground rules that have to be placed there. The second thing that the, they clarified is that the public facing applications like Facebook Live and TikTok, believe it or not, or YouTube cannot be used. Um, for providing clinical care or any clinical activity. If you are just providing a general public facing um, um, information, then that is fine, but for any kind of clinical activity that is considered telehealth and uh, that needs to be private could not be used using these applications. And there were exceptions made to HIPAA and high tech, um, just only during the period of public health emergency, and it stays for about 120 days from its initiation. So one needs to mark the clock and also keep an eye on when that changes. Um, but then the same standard of care and code of ethics uh, should be followed uh, during telehealth consultation. So obviously, um, if there are some adjustments that have to be made in order to make the visit uh, clinically relevant, then those all should be made as well. Next slide, please. Um, there were a couple of other changes, particularly around uh, prescribing control substances. The, uh, so providing a little bit of um, respite um, when it comes to uh, Ryan Hate Act, um, where you have to have an in-person visit. Um, uh, again, that's a federal law. Some states might have um, different statutes that might allow a prescription of controlled substances without an in-person visit. But in the case of this emergency, um, th that was kind of relaxed as well. Again, something to know and be comfortable about. Uh, otherwise, outside of emergency, there are only specific times and specific conditions 
where you can do that, uh, and, and that is something um, to look at. There are about seven exceptions, and that uh, information is available um, at the ACAP website as well, around when can you actually prescribe controlled substances appropriately uh, without the restriction of seeing an in-person, uh, having an in-person visit. Next slide, please. Um, so telehealth, it's, it's really a different venue that really needs a little bit of adjustment. And um, uh, some of us who uh, were around when we still had paper charts and we had to transition to electronic medical records, uh, clinical care pretty much was the same. Um, but transitioning uh, and changing and adjusting the way we documented and the way we conducted things was a little bit different. And it's pretty much uh, the same. The clinical care that you're providing when you're doing telehealth and when you're doing assessments and consultations or video conferencing is not really different, but because of the different setup and venue, there are certain things that we really have to be mindful about and train ourselves and adjust um, ourselves uh, while conducting those. So we'll go over uh, a few of those very quickly. Next slide, please. Um, so first of all, uh, understanding that it works, it really works, uh, that it's not really very different than what you are able to achieve, particularly when it comes to pediatric behavioral health. So there have been studies about diagnostic validity as well as reliability across um, different diagnoses, so it's certainly feasible. Next. Slide, please. Um, and when it comes to the outcomes, um, there have been randomized controlled trials across different conditions where the care provided through telehealth was comparable uh, to the in-person treatments. And there are multiple, multiple studies that were not in the uh, standard RCT design that also showed um, improvement um, in overall outcomes um, as well. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, just because you can do it doesn't mean that it's, it's going to be um, um, accepted uh, and embraced by providers and the patients, but there have been satisfaction studies as well um, across all the uh, stakeholders and entities when it comes to telehealth, so parents and, and kids and primary care providers and psychiatrists, uh, when then appropriately, it's very satisfying as well. Next slide. Um, so we'll uh, skip the slide, we just talked about it. So basic paradigms are around lights, camera, and action, and we call action uh, website manners, uh, just like our bedside manners that we have to uh, try to follow in order to make it a very authentic um, and um, uh, clinically relevant visit. Next slide. So um, first paradigm again is that um, we need to make sure the lighting is appropriate. If there's a backlight, then they cannot see you and you cannot see them. Uh, and so that interferes with um, appropriate facial expressions and appropriate communication because you're not able to uh, see the cues. Um, and so it's, it's very important that um, we uh, pay some attention to the lighting. Um, and again, camera needs much more light than the human eyes. And so we want to make sure that um, we uh, uh, conduct the session in a very well-lit area or at least try to find additional uh, lighting source um, if the room is dark. Next slide. So this is a good example where just because you can see somebody on screen doesn't mean that uh, they can see you and an, an overhead light um, as seen on the left, might be pretty okay for you to work, but when we when it comes to really uh, looking at it from the other side, uh, that is not. And so the right side uh, picture is what is an ideal one. So we definitely don't want a lot of direct light because then it can also interfere with um, a lot of uh, reflection on your glasses or um, uh, interfering with your vision, um, and it could be very bright, um, which could cause a lot of glare. Um, when the other person is seeing you. Uh, so any individual, any uh, in, um, indirect light uh, that is individualized um, according to the overall uh, light structure is something that we need. So here, for example, you see a window um, on the um, uh, uh, left side. And, and so to balance that out, we have uh, the light on the opposite side um, as well. Next slide, please. Um, and um, if you are in a closed room, then this could be a good solution as well, where again, the light is very indirect and bouncing off the walls 
uh, to create an, an appropriate ambience. Next slide, please. Um, camera is very important as well because having a good eye contact is really important, just as in our in-person uh, visits. Um, so we want to make sure that we uh, replicate the experience of good eye contact even when um, we are on a video conference. So best way to do that is really provide to um, provide appropriate elevation and um, put the camera almost at your eye level. Um, there should be a distance about two to four feet uh, from the camera so that you are not really uh, occupying the full uh, screen um, or full frame uh, for the other person to see. Um, it's also a good idea to put, uh, uh, go ahead, next slide please. It's also a good idea to position yourself um, so that your eyes are almost one third from the top of the screen. So that's called the one third rule. Um, and as long as you do that, um, that will mimic a good eye contact. Another thing that you can do is when you're looking at the uh, video of the person on the other end, uh, you might want to move that window closer to where the camera is so that when you're looking at camera, it really mimics a, a good eye contact and you don't have to avert the gaze uh, multiple times. If you are using multiple monitors, then um, try to um, put the monitors one above other, or if you're charting at the same time or documenting at the same time, then keep the camera um, window up and uh, uh, EHR or, or wherever you're typing a little down so that when you are uh, shifting the gaze it's up and down which could actually mimic nodding yes versus if you have it side to side and you're shifting gaze then it could mimic almost like you're saying no so nodding yes and smiling is always a good idea just as in in-person visits uh, that we want to mimic in video conferencing as well so that's kind of the one-third rule next slide please um, the same time on the other end, um, it's always a good idea to give uh, the parent um, or the child um, an opportunity to adjust their camera, uh, just like how they would feel some control if they were able to adjust the position of their chair when they're, when they're in their, their office. And also encourage them to do the same, to sit about two to three feet away. And if there are multiple uh, folks on the other end, for example, the parent and the child, or if they're both parents and the child, and there are three people, then for each person you want to add another two feet uh, of distance between the cameras so that everybody could be in the frame uh, and you can comment on everybody's expressions and concerns. Next slide. It's always a good idea to be in the frame and to be aware as to how you're looking in the frame as well. Uh, so always take a moment to adjust your camera um, and uh, use the video in video function um, so that you can see how you look um, and then you can forget about it um, and only keep the uh, patient um, uh, window. But other than that, um, it's, it's, uh, it's very common that we might just fade away from the frame. And um, they can only uh, uh, see uh, what's in the frame. So it's always a good idea to uh, keep everything in the frame um, very clear, uh, very respectful, um, and complete as much as possible. Next slide. So this is a good um, position uh, to be in the camera frame. There's a nice one-third rule. You have uh, appropriate amount of face and a little bit of body, which really mimics an in-person visit. But again, you are limiting what, uh, what's in the frame. You go to the next slide. This is exactly what, what it is. And so it could be very messy. There could be many different things around, but as long as you control what is visible in the frame by controlling a backdrop and only um, having um, only a portion of you uh, using the one third rule in camera placement, then it should be fine. So don't worry about really thinking of having an ideal place, especially when you're um, uh, working from home. Um, to conduct these visits. Uh, it could be a very simple, non-distracting backdrop in the form of um, a sheet that's of neutral color that could achieve that. Or you can use the um, virtual backgrounds like the one that I'm using uh, right now as well um, to make it very pleasant. Next slide, please. Um, there are other adjustments in actions, as I call the website manners. It's very, very important to integrate a lot of 
nonverbal communication. Um, um, waving is the video uh, parallel of um, hello or shake hands. Um, and anyway, during uh, current COVID-19 era, you don't want to shake hands. So maybe this waving piece or, uh, would be something that we will continue even after this. But fist bumps and other things are really, really kind of hip for uh, youth and uh, trying to do those while you're on camera uh, really helps with a lot of uh, rapport building. Um, having a very open and erect posture um, really conveys attention. And, and, and just as you would convey um, concern um, or attention with your facial expression, you can lean forward um, uh, to uh, uh, accentuate uh, that expression as well. And leaning backward kind of shows kind of relaxed, uh, nice, friendly uh, gesture as well. Uh, you also want to limit and adjust the hand gestures to stay within the frame. Uh, so if you're somebody who uses very big hand gestures, um, it will look very awkward to see the hand wave like this instead of wave like this. So always want to make sure that all of your hand gestures are a little bit of a little bit restricted in order to fit in the camera frame as well. Next slide please. So it's not what is said but how it is said that matters. So um, you want to always consider a little bit of lag or transmission delay. Um, so the clearly and slowly you speak, the better it is. Um, in fact, it kind of uh, activates probably the mirror neurons and the uh, anxious youth can also calm down and try to mimic you and, and talk slowly as well. In fact, we often use this as, a, as a, an excuse to help them calm down and, and use some self-regulation um, and talk slowly uh, by giving the reason of just uh, some uh, data lag. Um, it's always a good idea to avoid any verbal fillers like uh-huh or go on or tell me more or really, those kind of things, uh, because uh, there's a chance that if there are more than one people, then you'll be talking over each other since you're not able to pay full attention to everybody's expression, depending on how the videos are structured. Um, instead, it's always a good idea to use a nonverbal gestures that uh, go on or that's really great or uh, using some facial expressions that are a little bit exaggerated to show surprise um, or a big smile. And when in doubt uh, and appropriate, nod and smile. You can never go wrong when it comes to nodding and smiling when somebody's um, talking a lot during the teleconference. Next slide, please. Uh, sounds are very impor important. Uh, you're as good um, as you sound. So uh, it's very much like um, uh, keep, if you keep talking for a minute or so, uh, but you're on mute, uh, then it, it, it's not useful uh, because uh, uh, other parties are not able to hear you at all. And so it's very important that um, you pay uh, good attention to your sounds as well. So you want to pause uh, more often longer um, if you're working obviously from home so um, you might want to use a good um, headset uh, and a microphone um, it's always a good idea to uh, use a headset and a microphone or an external microphone uh, to avoid a little bit of feedback loop and echo um, that could be otherwise generated from the integrated microphones um, next slide please and it's always a good idea to also be a little bit mindful of the other um, sounds and uh, noises that could be going on in the um, background, including your air conditioners or if your home office or office is right close to the um, street where there's traffic or there's a, a, a teenager in your household watching Netflix uh, while they're trying to conduct your session in your home office. There are other ambient sounds like um, rustling of paper, which is really one of the main distractors. Um, typing as you're talking, and if your keyboard is not good, then that really interferes with your sound as well. Um, and um, other things like uh, the um, um, uh, little uh, gestures that you have around uh, doodling or tapping of pen or pencils, those also could be uh, really interfering with your noise. So uh, you really have to be very mindful about the um, uh, way uh, 
you are heard on the other end and avoid any kind of uh, distractions. Next slide, please. Uh, room setup a little bit uh, uh, quickly. Um, you obviously want to have a very uh, soft and neutral colors and not really the glossy paint because that uh, otherwise tend to uh, be uh, a reflective surface and causes a lot of distraction. Um, you again want to avoid any reflective surfaces in the background. If you have a glass frame or a mural or any other um, uh, object that could be shiny, you probably want to remove those from the backgrounds. Um, uh, always be mindful of uh, your PHI in the background. If you have notes, uh, little phone numbers with names, uh, to-do list tasks, anything that could have any PHI, um, those are something that we need to be mindful of. And it, it's also very important to be mindful of your clothing. Uh, you want, definitely want plain and solid colored ones and not the uh, uh, very striped or patterned clothes because that really interferes um, with the way camera is capturing the image. And if there is a lag, then it could look very awkward um, as well. Um, and so those are kind of the basics of light camera action, um, some quick rules around uh, telehealth and current relaxations that will likely end or would be continued after modification. So we want to keep an eye on that. Next slide. And that's it for me. Jack. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramtakar. And, and um, you know, it's, really, it's really interesting. I, I actually think that um, you know, most pediatric primary care providers have gotten a crash course on uh, telehealth you know, over the last uh, six weeks. Um, but I'm not sure that uh, our colleagues in the medical community uh, sort of pay as much attention to some of these issues that you've raised for us around rapport and set and things like that, which is of course really important for behavioral health, you know, because it's all about sort of this engagement and, and kind of, um, you know, being able to really kind of connect and make people feel comfortable and really having good communication. I mean, it's important in every medical specialty, but, but it's especially important in, in behavioral health. So, so we as psychiatrists, I think, think uh, a lot about that. I, I would just add one piece is that you know you've you've um, shown us uh, you know just high level overview of it of of, of data you know and study uh, that has shown that telehealth actually really works you know in, in psychiatry and in, in child psychiatry and adult psychiatry um, and I would actually go even farther as to say that uh, I've had some experiences in the last uh, several weeks which have made me think that at times telehealth is actually even better in some ways, you know, beyond the access to care issues. But, but I've actually found, you know, that seeing a patient in his or her own home is, is really, uh, you know, rich, you know, and something that gives me more access to understanding my patient uh, than I've had before. So I've had patients that I've treated for decades and, uh, and, and seen their inside of their home for the first time and, and had some real eye openers um, in the last uh, couple of weeks in terms of what I've seen. Um, and, and so that, I think that's a really interesting sort of aspect that it could be, could be better, you know, and, and not just a compromise. So, so I think that, um, you know, we'll take some, we'll, we'll pause for some questions. You know, we have ample time, I think, to, to have questions and, and answers about this material. Um, and I don't see if there's any questions on the question uh, section, but um, uh, why don't people think about whether they have questions for Dr. Remtakar or just about telehealth in general. And um, if not, then um, I think we can turn it over to Dr. Brooks to uh, pitch us some questions, uh, both for the panel and also for the audience um, that kind of gets into more broad, you know, areas of, of really not just the telehealth kind of material, but also how, you know, we uh, take care of patients, you know, with behavioral health problems in the primary care setting uh, in our current uh, COVID-19 uh, world. So I don't, I don't see any questions or I don't know if there's any raised hands for questions, but I think um, 
Betsy, why don't you go, go right ahead? I, I wanted to echo what Barry was saying about the attention to creating the atmosphere uh, in the telehealth encounter. I think um, it was very um, something that as we've migrated to telehealth, having someone uh, you know, draw that out so nicely was incredibly helpful. Um, I wondered about the other side of that on the patient side. Um, is there um, a place that you usually like to see your patients? If, if the family's at home and there's some choices, do you like to see children in, you know, where do you like to see the children? Yeah, um, wherever they are comfortable. Um, so uh, we just, um, uh, try to uh, coach the same things that we reviewed here that don't have too distracting background, um, sit comfortably, make sure that you're visible on the camera and wherever they are. So I've seen kids on their dining tables to um, uh, 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 their couches on the, uh, in the uh, main family area. Um, if there are teenagers, older kids, um, and if there are other clinical concerns, we definitely don't want to see them in their bedrooms, in their private play spaces, but as open area, the better, uh, provided there's privacy. For younger kids, obviously, we want to make sure that there's a parent around. Um, for little bitty kiddos, um, the kids who are a little hyperactive as well uh, because of ADHD, um, having the child sit next to the parent is very helpful, and if they're very young kids, um, under the age of uh, four, um, then sometimes sitting in the lap of the parent um, is also helpful so that they could control um, their um, moving around a little bit by also uh, giving the opportunity to, to hear the parent and also see the child at the same time. So we, we have a question from uh, Robert Nelkin. Um, uh, Ujwal, it's uh, how do you arrange for questionnaires like the SCARED or the PHQ-9 or Vanderbilt to be completed before the encounter? Is that all done online? I love the question because we're so happy to hear about uh, uh, pediatric primary care providers using these kinds of um, rating scales. Go ahead. Right, so uh, it's, I think it's a great question and, and everybody should be thinking about this measurement-based care when doing these uh, psychiatric evaluations and follow-up. Um, it, it depends on uh, whatever platform you're using. So if you're on Epic and they have a MyChart functionality um, or any other um, parent-focused uh, or parent-facing uh, app, for communication, then there is usually a functionality of sending uh, these uh, uh, screeners um, and um, other measures uh, ahead of the time. Um, if that's not the case, uh, then um, if on your video functioning you have a screen sharing uh, type of function, then um, we capture the responses to common screeners like PHQ-9, or ASQ for suicide screen if the VHQ9 is positive um, simultaneously because that again provides a little bit of context uh, to shape the content of your conversation. Um, uh, particularly it's relevant now with uh, COVID-19 um, where um, there's no way of getting some collateral from schools since schools are out um, and there is really uh, no way of getting the direct uh, paperwork mailed to you because probably you're also not going into the office and probably uh, working from an alternative space. Um, that uh, either using uh, that kind of online capability of uh, uh, sending the screeners uh, through the HIPAA compliant platform or doing it simultaneously is what we do. Now there are other um, um, uh, commercial uh, products out there as well. So in pediatrics, for example, Chadis is one that um, allows you to send the screeners and, and uh, I think there are many different internal solutions within different systems as well uh, where they can send a link uh, uh, through private messaging in a HIPAA compliant platform and that collects all the um, information and ports in directly um, into your EHR. But again, that depends totally on um, if you're a small practice versus part of a larger system and whatever the technology solution you have, but it's very feasible. So we have a question. Thank you, uh, Ujwal. We have a question um, from Lori Trask, um, and, and it's uh, about uh, the orchestration of the 
you know, the choreography, you know, of a, of a visit, you know, for uh, child psychiatry, you know, with parents and, and teenagers. And, and so the question is, I've asked parents to leave the room to give the teen a chance to interact with myself confidentially. Are there tips I need to be aware of when I do this? Yes, I think that's, again, a very good question. So um, as, as Dr. Sarwad had said early on as well, uh, after the presentation, uh, that many times, you know, it's very same or better than uh, our in-person visit. So we want to reinforce that, that, that this is not something that's inferior to our in-person in visit, that somehow this is just a, a matter of convenience and we can compromise on quality. So what we'd like to say is this is just like as you would be in our office. And so we're going to have the same ground rules. So we're going to talk together. Uh, the, the confidentiality rules still apply. And so um, at times I might have to talk to the, the parent alone and um, to the child alone. And we need to respect that. Um, and so we put the onus on both a uh, child and the parent uh, as we set up uh, and start the meeting. Um, we also then, uh, just to extend that, although not related to question, we also clarified that the same rules for safety also apply. Um, um, so if any time I feel like there's a concern for safety or if there are certain things like you're disclosing me about um, uh, drugs that are uh, uh, that, that have the potential of you um, endangering yourself, then I have to disclose it to the parents. So the exceptions to the confidentiality also apply here. So, so um, uh, setting the ground rules early on uh, in the visit uh, and comparing it just like the in-person visit uh, really helps. Um, and um, many a times you can actually uh, build a little bit of rapport with the parent or the child by asking them to move their phone or tablet or camera to ensure that the parent or the child is not in the room and that they really have ex uh, exited the room and you can share a little bit of giggle uh, through this detective work with them as well. Yeah, it's a little bit um, challenging in the sense that you know, in the office, you have control over the environment, you know, whereas where the patient is and, and in the home, you really don't have that control. And so, so the, the, the protection of the privacy of particularly for teenagers, but even for younger kids is, um, you know, an important thing to pay attention to, you know, to do the best that we can with that. Now, we have another question, which actually... Uh, Barry, I have one thing to, to kind of add that... Uh, oh, right, probably. The... Yep. Uh, the other thing I've learned to use is the, um, depending on the platform or breakout rooms or uh, waiting rooms, I found that really helpful, uh, especially if sometimes with the older teenagers who may be at home and they have a working parent. This week just happened to be um, ER nurse week. And so most of my parents were uh, in ERs. And so they were able to uh, participate um, all in a, in, a, in a virtual chat. And so we had everybody together. I could move a parent to the, the waiting room, chat with the, the, the teen, then bring the parent back and kind of wrap everything up. Also allowed some uh, folks like maybe the, um, a dad or something who's a little bit, uh, maybe not always the primary care to get a little bit of a sense and be a little bit a part of that. Um, so I found those two, like, but using some of that technology has been helpful. That's great, Charlie. Thanks a lot. That's um, I think some of the systems are fancier than others, and so so you guess you have to find out uh, what your system can do. But those are pretty cool sort of options to have. Um, so there's a question actually, which is nice because it's going to help us to pivot to kind of more general issues around you know taking care of patients and our current uh, situation. And so it's from an anonymous uh, attendee who's probably calling in on the phone. Um, it says, has the migration to telehealth made child psychiatry visits more available? And, and I wonder, Charlie, if you could speak to that just, um, you know, at least from the standpoint of, um, you know, having to think about, you know, how to navigate the mental health system these days, um, you know, because there's been dramatic changes in, in the whole you know, system of care and the network of, of, of resources for child psychiatry in recent weeks and uh, it'd be good for people to kind of have a heads up about that. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's a, a excellent question about, how, you know, is there is there more availability um, in, in, you know, so just speaking from my experience, it, see, it feels like 
um, in general, there's been a, a big, a larger uh, availability, much more access to care. So we've been able to see uh, more easily, in, in some ways, uh, more patients and to do a more kind of check-in or, or um, uh, other kinds of ways of kind of really helping connect and get patients care. Uh, and, but the, you know, there's been a slower uptick of the other mental health clinics, but they're all catching up with um, their telepsych abilities. And um, so in general, my, my feeling is there's probably going to be more access or easier access. Certainly the working parent um, or, or is, is going to be, um, I think, you know, it's very, it's a big deal trying to find time to set away, set aside time, make it to an appointment, have the appointment, make it back, you know, uh, set out some time. So, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, I've been very surprised about how um, positive the experience has been. What about, um, thank you, Charlie. What, what about, um, you know, other levels of care, you know, beyond you know, outpatient? Um, that uh, certainly inpatient uh, units are 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 actually you know not only open you know for for taking care of patients but but the census you know across the state has been lower than normal so so it should be you know easier to get people hospitalized if they need that um, certainly if they're as long as the <laughs> patients are COVID negative and I think a lot of a lot of places are screening prior to admission nowadays now that testing is a little bit more. Available. I would I would add that our our, our partial hospital program, at least at Bay State, uh, has uh, started uh, a virtual uh, partial uh, service, so that that we're doing uh, virtual groups and um, and and you know having a full day you know program uh, for kids uh, from their homes at the partial level of care. I think the jury is out as far as how. Um, you know how that compares to in-person partial, um, and and it certainly requires a lot more of a commitment from the family um, in terms of you know managing the kids' behavior during the day, which is something the program does. You know, I think one of the biggest advantages of partial for people is it it offers respite, you know, to the families, and so they don't get that respite, you know, if someone's still at home uh, doing an online program. But uh, but it, but at least it's good to know that that's available, and I think that that other parts of the state are also uh, beginning to offer virtual partial programs. Uh, but I don't know if you can speak any more to that, Charlie. Well, I think you did a nice job. The, um, there are, yeah, we have a, at McLean Southeast, we have a, a 16 bed uh, virtual, or 16 virtual partial spaces. Um, essentially, there's like two pods of, uh, of uh, clinicians working with, you know, groups of eight. So that's kind of how we do it. Um, I know the OCD folks, um, not just in this state, but in other states are ramping up their virtual programs. And virtual uh, treatment for OCD has been around for a while and very helpful because there very frequently needs to be uh, in-home observation of ritual and coaching. Um, so that's been around and, and probably gonna blossom more. Uh, so I think that's pretty interesting. Also, the uh, eating disorder programs, the IOPs are moving a little bit towards virtual and fits very nicely in with the family-based eating disorder care. So um, some of those programs sort of existed um, and they're just really being enhanced. Um, Barry? Right. Yes, John. This, this is John Strauss. Um, just one thing from the, my PAP point of view that uh, uh, as folks know, we try and have a uh, when we need to do a face-to-face -face consult uh, or now a video consult, we try and do that within two weeks. And one thing for those of you listening on the phone is this now having the televideo available, uh, we don't, you're not dependent upon just having to go to your own, uh, to the hub nearest your, where the family is. Uh, we're now uh, able to do consults across teams so that uh, if, uh, uh, for example, there's a wait, two, more than a wait, uh, two-week wait at, uh, let's say, uh, Bay State, then someone on one of the Eastern teams can do that uh, consult. So that, uh, I think, has been a real advantage, and we hope to be able to continue that uh, even after the, the uh, crisis is over. Yeah, you know, related to that point, John, is that the virtual care that's being provided now um, 
you know, just as an example, you know, for partial that that our partial program is getting referrals and taking referrals of patients from all over the state, you know, right now. And so, so when you sort of take away that geographic uh, issue, uh, yeah. and um, you know, there's just more options for patients, and so you can refer patients to clinics and uh, programs that are uh, far away and get sort of uh, access to more specialized kinds of services uh, sometimes than you would otherwise. Right. But just as a warning, because you may all of a sudden get a uh, return consult from someone you're not used to on your yeah. team. Yeah. Betsy. I, I wanted to add a comment. Um, in, the liter in the literature and in the news, you hear about, you know, where are, are all the heart attacks going? That, um, you know, in this moment, I think we all feel that children aren't having less behavioral health challenges, there are probably more, yet the usual paths to referral and care may not be as apparent to, um, to families who have those needs. And, um, you know, I was just wondering what your thoughts are as a, a panel, you know, are we, is there um, a building demand that we're going to, to see as this continues or you know, wh where have all of uh, the long wait lists gone and uh, what's driving it and what's that gonna look like over the next month? Um, I, th I think that uh, there is a growing build. It feels kind of like the uh, beginning of a school year. Usually the kids kind of all do okay for the first couple, couple weeks or a month and then and then it all starts coming, you know, the school anxiety, the stress, the tension. So um, I, it feels that just by uh, the number of calls and who's calling, it, it feels like it's coming. Um, so there's been a little bit of a hiatus. I think everybody was, it's novel and people are at home, but it, we're starting to really kind of get those referrals. Um, so I do think there's that momentum coming. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're starting to notice uh, some of this um, material kind of coming coming back, you know, and, and more sort of normalizing the referral patterns uh, gradually. But actually, I'm curious about the audience and whether anyone in the audience uh, wants to share what their experience is, you know, lately in terms of the, um, you know, mental health needs that are kind of uh, coming to your attention, you know, as, as primary care pro providers. You can just raise your hand if you want to want to jump in. Um, as we're waiting for that, I have some colleagues in uh, Denmark and France, and they were talking about the return to school that they've been doing was primarily for um, child development and uh, their uh, psychiatric emotional well-being. Um, that's been the the driver for them considering to reopen schools. It hasn't been. That's the number one thing that the public health um, uh, is worried about and uh, sort of the driver. So. We are going to need schools. We need them to kind of come back. Uh, a lot of them have come back along, you know, in some sort of online fashion. But things like school-based therapy, school-based counseling, they're they're a little slower to catch up. So um, yeah. it's a big concern. So Betsy, do you have any quest other questions that you'd like to pitch to either the audience or to the panel? Um, sure. Um, one thing that many people in our network have been doing is looking at their um, populations of kids with diagnosed anxiety or ADHD or uh, depression and uh, you know, being more proactive in a check-in uh, to see how they're doing in this uh, you know, difficult circumstance. Is this something that you have any suggestions, you know, about how you do this? Is it a good idea? Uh, any pearls on that? Yeah, Char Charlie, do you um, have thoughts about that? Well, I was thinking it was a good question for you, Barry. You're pretty, you're, I, I'm not so adept at the, um, you know, population health, uh, so. You know. I think that probably is more of a primary care function. I think the primary care, depending on the information system, many, many primary care providers are able to pull up their lists of patients who have ang diagnosed anxiety yeah, or yeah, their, yeah. their patients with ADHD or depression. Yeah, um, yeah. But so I, I guess, you know, what kind of a uh, reach out yeah, yeah. would make sense? Um, so I think, um, you know, I, I would just say, you know, just in general that, um, 
you know, that, that, that we really all need to, whether you're primary care or whether you're a, a, a community psychiatrist, um, need to be thinking about the patients who don't present <laughs> you know that that um, you know a lot of times care is very like reactive where we sort of you know people come to us and we help them and and um, but if they don't come you know we don't help them and and so there are lots of people who need help who aren't coming nowadays because they don't know how the health system is functioning and uh, and oftentimes like it's not functioning you know in the way that that it should and so I think that there are a lot of patients out there who you know, sort of, we do need to check in with, and, and we need to be more proactive and not just wait for them to make appointments. And so, however, you know, you can do this, you know, whether you have a registry system and you can notice uh, patients, you know, who haven't really been been followed up in a, in a long time, you know, by looking at the dates on your registry, or if you just have to kind of go through, you know, your uh, charts, you know, electronically and, and, and try to take a look because, you know, the, I think the point is that <clears throat> the patients, uh, that, that they're not getting the normal care and, um, and, and you, you need to have some way of identifying, you know, the patients who are, are higher risk and, and do more proactive, you know, outreach for them. I know Ujwal has got a lot of experience in population health, so I don't know if you have any uh, thoughts to share, you know, on this particular topic. Yeah, I mean, we we um, use the population health registry um, through our integrated primary care practices. Um, so we exactly do what you just said, Barry, around um, looking at the case loads and looking at has there been a gap since the last um, a point of care, and then if there has been significant gap since their last visit, uh, but they had elevated scores, then uh, the clinicians reach out to them in an anticipatory way. Barry, I think we have some questions that you may want to address. Yeah, before we end, uh, I, I was I was leaving one of the questions for, um, you know, there's, there's two comments and one question, and I was leaving one of the questions for the end because I wanted to get into that general material. Um, but, but so one person asked the question about, um, Saying I've been reading questionnaires to teens um, verbally, you know, and and the question is that okay? Um, and it says that we don't seem to be able to send screening questionnaires through patient gateway platform for teens under 18. So, so I assume that's the patient gateway is the electronic uh, portal uh, for administering uh, patient reported outcome measures. <clears throat> and um, and so I, my answer to that question is um, yes, you know it is okay. Um, but not, you know, ideal, you know, because, um, you know, the questionnaires are, 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 are known to be more sensitive um, when they're filled out, you know, sort of um, by the patient and not verbally pitched, you know, to the patient because sometimes people are more comfortable, you know, sort of answering a question when there's not sort of this, you know, face-to-face -face, um, or sort of this uh, live interaction. Um, and then, of course, there's you know potential confidentiality issues and things like that. So, so it's but 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 again, you know, we're practical. Everyone, all every one of us is a practical person. If we do primary care or if we do primary care mental health or collaborative care, and so we do what we can, you know. And um, and so if 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 our only option is really to ask the questions verbally, I think that still can provide you know very uh, useful information. Um, and, uh, you know, you might not sort of be able to rely on the score uh, per se, you know, because it's not the same as the way the measures have been validated, uh, but uh, I think it still works and, and could be useful. Um, I think we are, we're almost at time. I do want to read off a couple of comments uh, that came in. So uh, one person wrote, uh, this is not a question, but my pa with my patients, I've noticed an increase in anger management issues in some of the homes of my patient's family. And I think that's a great point and something for us to be aware of that there, you know, we're all concerned about the increased risk of child abuse, um, you know, not just, you know, sort of anger management issues uh, for kids, but, but for, ki for parents as well, that, that people are kind of cooped up um, and they have to deal with each other when in the past, you know, they, you know, for longer periods of time and, and everyone is stressed at home, and so so it's a major concern, sort of concern about safety for children 
uh, right now. And I think that's one of the reasons why we decided to devote the last clinical conversations to, um, you know, sort of advice for helping parents uh, to manage their kids at home for prolonged periods of time, you know, and how to prevent, you know, things from going, going awry. Uh, we have another comment from Robert Nelkin, who uh, wrote, uh, we have two clinical social workers in our office, and they've been very busy doing virtual visits during the crisis and be able to see new patients fairly promptly, uh, which is wonderful to hear. Um, and then finally, uh, David Pangburn wrote, our practice has been scheduling med checks with our not thriving with online education or Google Classroom. Uh, many are emotionally thriving. So, so that's from Dr. Pangbird at AOLife uh, Brook Community Pediatrics in Arlington. So I think we are at our time. I um, want to um, give sincere thanks to all of our panelists, uh, as well as, as always, to Beth again and Sarah Rosadini for um, coordinating and sort of getting everything organized and, and set up for, for the program. And uh, we'll look forward to being with you next month. We're hoping uh, to uh, put out the announcement uh, soon, but the, the topic for next month is gonna be to introduce our uh, new guideline on uh, PTSD in, in children. So we have a practice uh, uh, clinical algorithm um, for PTSD with a set of uh, clinical pearls that we're gonna be um, uh, distributing um, and uh, we're going to sort of teach the, the guideline on the on the webinar next month. So thanks everybody and uh, have a have a nice uh, rest of your day.